Welcome to Pulse. It's Professor Lemus Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you are just joining us or you have not subscribed, I would like you to subscribe now and be part of this amazing anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. This is the part two in our series of lectures on the ulnar nerve. In this section, we will be discussing the ulnar nerve injuries and the associated clinical correlates. So let's go to class. With our knowledge base on the motor distribution of the deep branch of ulnar nerve, I'm sure we can now prefer a solution to the question we gave at the beginning of this lecture in the part one of this series. And what was that question? The question was why is the deep branch of ulnar nerve called the musician nerve? Well, it is called the musician nerve because it innervates all the small muscles of the hand that are involved in fine movements. Those movements that will bring that wonderful note from the guitar and the keyboard. So the nerve supplying those small muscles is actually the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. In considering the clinical correlates expressed in ulnar nerve injury, we will first look at the motor and sensory effects following such injury, then we will consider the disability and associated deformity. For motor effects, muscles likely to be affected in ulnar nerve injury are, as we listed them, we noted the flexor capi ulnaris, we noted the medial half of flexor tutorum profundus, we also talked about all the interossi, and then the medial two lumbricals, that's the third and the fourth. Then for the sensory loss, we also noted sensory loss over medial one and a half of finger on both surfaces, and disabilities, we are going to notice that there will be loss of abduction and adduction of the fingers. We we'll see this deformity and this deformity is wasting of the hypotenar muscle and this will lead to a condition called the ulnar claw hand or the partial claw hand. In this slide, we will categorize the types of ulnar injuries. Ulnar injuries can be above the elbow. If ulnar injuries are above the elbow, this injury will be classified as high ulnar palsy. When it is below the elbow, it will be classified as low ulnar palsy. This table summarizes the effects of high ulnar lesion on functions of various muscles it supplies. We we'll recall that in high ulnar palsy, where the injury is above the elbow, it will mean that all the muscles that are innervated by ulnar nerve will be affected because it is from the point of the elbow distally that ulnar nerve started giving its supplies. So high ulnar nerve palsy affects all the muscles supplied by ulnar and also all the skin area will be affected. What are some of these muscles? From the flexor capa ulnaris down to the media half of flexor tutorum profundus, the hypotena and the lumbricals, their functions will be affected. Now we start with flexor capa ulnaris. The function is wrist flexion. During high ulnar palsy, this muscle will be paralyzed, and then it will mean that flexion at the wrist will be impaired. The middle half of flexor lateral profundus will flex both proximal and distal interphalangeal joints of the fourth and fifth fingers. And this muscle in high ulnar palsy is seen to be paralyzed. 
And what will happen? There will be loss of flexion at both the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints of these two fingers. Now also know that ulnar nerve supplies all the hypotenar muscles. So movement of all the little finger will be affected. Now for the lumbricals and interussi, their function is flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension at the interphalangeal joints. At high ulnar palsy, these muscles are affected. Now, there will be impairment in their function. First, at the metacarpophalangeal joint, there will be extension. And then, at the interphalangeal joint, there will be flexion. Now, we'll compare this table with the effects we saw in the high ulnar palsy. This table summarizes the effect seen in low honor palsy. Now we have two simple differences. The differences are coming from the muscles that are spared in low honor palsy. Beginning from flexor kappa onaris that is spared. Because flexor kappa onaris is spared, the loss in flexion seen in high honor palsy will not be seen here. So flexion at the wrist is normal. Also, the medial half of flexor tibia profundus is also spared. Now, the loss of flexion of the interphalangeal joint of the fourth and fifth finger we noted in high ulnar palsy will also be spared. Now, the remaining conditions that we saw in high ulnar palsy will also be seen at this level because from hypotenar muscles to lumbricus and all the rest they are also still affected even in low ulnar palsy and their functions are also impaired now this is the presentation in low ulnar palsy so the major deformity we see in low ulnar palsy is the ulnar claw hand there is clawing of the fourth and then the fifth fingers. That's the little finger and the ring finger. This is because of the loss of the third and fourth lumbricals, which are supplied only by ulnar nerve. Now, these other two are not clawed because they are supplied by median nerve. We we'll look at a condition which is known as ulnar paradox. Ulnar paradox is the absence of ulnar claw hand in high ulnar palsy and its presence in low honor palsy. That is to say that if there is high honor palsy, this patient will not show the honor claw hand or the partial claw hand. And the honor claw hand or partial claw hand is seen only in low honor palsy. And why is it so? The honor claw happens as a result of the flexion activity of the medial two digit of flexor distorum profundus. In high ulnar palsy, the flexor distorum profundus muscles are also involved. Therefore, this flexion will not be seen in these medial two fingers. But in low ulnar palsy, where these muscles are spared, these muscles will automatically flex the distal interphalangeal joint leading to clawing of these fingers and because the lumbricals which are supposed to extend them are also paralyzed these two fingers will stay flexed and no lumbrical or interossi to extend it so this results in the absence of clawing in the high honor palsy and presence of clawing in low honor palsy. Before we run off our study on honor nerve, we are going to consider some of the clinical tests for honor nerve palsy. They are the CAT test, the GAWA test, Froman sign test, and then the Wartenbach test. So we'll start with the CAT test. The CAT test is used to assess the adduction function of the palmar interosite. Here, the card is placed between the finger of the patient, as we can see in this illustration. 
Now the patient is asked to hold the card tightly. The examiner tries to pull the card sharply from the finger grip. The ease of withdrawing this card will determine if the palmar interosseous muscles are still functional. If they are functional, the adduction function will be strong because the palmar interosseous are actually the adductors and this function is an adduction function. So if the ulnar nerve is functional, there will be innervation to the interosseous. Palmar interosseous are the adductors and if the adductors are functioning, there will be firm gripping of this card by the fingers. But if they are not working, there will be a lot of ease in withdrawing this card from in between the patient's fingers. The next test is the Egawa test. The Egawa test is used to assess the abduction function of the dorsal interosci. Remember the card test was for the palma interosci and that test was for abduction. Now we will use the Egawa test to check for abduction. The palm is placed on a flat surface and all the other fingers abducted. With the rest of the other fingers fixed on the flat surface, this patient is asked to make an attempt to abduct the middle finger either to the left or to the right. Inability to do this shows the weakness or paralysis of the dosa interosci and pointing to the fact that there is a lesion of the ulnar nerve supplying these muscles. The Froment test is used to assess the adduction function of the adductor pollicis. The adductor pollicis is also one of the muscles supplied by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. In this test, the patient is asked to hold a book in the way it has been presented here. And in normal function, this book will be held in such a way that the patient's thumb is extended in this form. But when there is ulnar nerve lesion, the patient will be seen holding the book in this form. This patient is able to hold the book in this form, the thumb extended, because the pressure on the book is generated from the adductor pollicis. But in an ulnar party condition here, where this force is lost, the force to hold the thumb onto the book will no longer be generated from the adductor policies, but will be generated from the flexor policies longus. That's why you're seeing this flexion at this joint. And this will cause the position of the thumb to be flexed, a sign which is known as the from a sign as we are seeing here. Before we round off on the clinical correlates associated to the ulna, we will consider the cause of the ulna nerve in the cubital tunnel as we noted earlier in our lecture. This is a point which is clinically significant because of the possibilities of compression of ulna in this narrow compartment, a condition that is called ulnar nerve entrapment. So, the cubital tunnel is this space that is seen at the posterior medial aspect of the elbow. Now, this is the tunnel. This is the cubital tunnel. This narrow space has these boundaries. Medially, we have the medial epicondyle here. Now, laterally, here, we have the olecranon process of the ulna and the tendinous arch joining the humeral and ulnar heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Here we see the ulna in a normal cubital tunnel without being compressed. That's here. But in the second diagram, we see the nerve being compressed at this point. We will now consider ulnar nerve entrapment in this cubital tunnel. Ulnar nerve entrapment, also called cubital tunnel syndrome occurs when ulnar nerve becomes compressed or entrapped along its path. 
Entrapment happens most commonly on the inside of the elbow as the nerve passes through the cubital tunnel, as you can see in this illustration. Now, this nerve lies vulnerable in this tunnel because this tunnel is a narrow space with very little soft tissue that could give it protection and it also lies behind the axis of the elbow flexion. As a consequence to this, the nerve is stretched and compressed as the elbow is brought into greater degrees of flexion. We'll end by looking at some of the presentations in ulnar nerve entrapment in the cubital tunnel. Now, ulnar nerve entrapment can cause numbness and tingling in the hand and fingers. Number two, it can also send shocks of pain and tingling to the little finger and ring finger if accidentally struck in this location. And when this happens, it is responsible for the nickname Fummy Bone. Severe cubital tunnel syndrome will not only cause numbness of the little and ring finger of the hand, but it can also result in loss of fine motor skills of the hand. In addition to these presentations, some patients also report their hands feeling clumsy and also dropping of things unintentionally with loss of their agility and skills.